Because it's so much more interesting. So, if you want one. You hit the enlarge button and that'll make it big. Okay. But it uh, looks like a you guys hear me in Los Alamos? That's weird. Yeah, we can hear you, but we can hear someone else talking over you. Yeah, you don't know yeah, where it's coming there's from. Some strange, uh, looks like it didn't. Yeah, I hear that now too. I can hear someone else. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me now? You can hang up and redial. We can still hear it. <laughs> Person in the booth, can you help us? Need a few <laughs> Okay, it's gone now. It's gone now? You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. But we can't okay. see you now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right, so now we can see you. Okay, now they can see you. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, let's go back to the... Oh, is this not working? I don't know. It just sounded like they weren't able to hear you, and sometimes this one does fink out. So I think it's okay now. Is I'll it just leave it's it okay in now? case they can't hear you. Yeah, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jump up and down and wave at the camera if, uh, <laughs> if anything goes wrong. Um, all right. So uh, I'm inflicting two books on you this semester. Um, one of them is Sipser's Introduction to the theory of computation. I'm going to be using that mainly for the material on finite state automata. Um, so every theoretical computer scientist um, begrudges teaching finite state automata. But his other colleagues in the department tell him that this is really important. So I'm going to teach you about finite state automata, and maybe even a little bit about context-free languages which are a kind of stripped down model of um, you know, programming languages and compilers. Um, but of course, what, a, what someone like, like me really wants to teach you is P and NP and NP completeness and why the problem of whether P equals NP or not is so incredibly deep and wonderful and also why it's so hard, why we don't know the answer, why we probably won't know the answer for another 100 years. And I want to try to get across the, st the fact that um, the difficulty of a problem has a lot to do with its logical depth 
that for some problems, if the answer is yes, and you claim to me that the answer is yes, you can provide me a simple proof of that claim. And I'll say, oh, yes, I see. You're right. The answer is yes. But for other problems, um, like here's a position in the game of chess. It's black's move. Does black have a winning strategy? You claim to me the answer is yes. I say, gosh, I, I, tell me why. You can say, well, you know, uh, I have godlike computational powers, but you, professor, are a mere mortal. There's really no way for me to explain. I can see in my mind an exponentially huge tree of all the possible ways that the game could go from here. And as long as black does the right thing at each point, every one of them will end with black checkmating white. But I'm afraid I can't show you that tree. It's just too large. So in that, in that, in that case, proving this fact to me is very difficult. Whereas another classic problem is uh, the traveling salesman problem. So I have a list of 100 cities. Um, it's my, uh, my Wanderjahr, as they say in German. It's my, it's my year off. I've, I've graduated. I have my PhD. I haven't yet been snapped up by industry. So I want to go on a tour of the world. And the question is, can I visit all these cities with a total tour of less than 100,000 miles? Well, in that case, if the answer is yes, it might be hard to find the answer because there are astronomically many different ways that I could use to try to visit these cities, um, many different orders I could visit them in. But if there is a way to visit them all with a total length of less than 10,000 miles, it's easy enough to show that to me because I can easily check that the tour visits each of those cities and that the total length is less than 10,000 miles. So in that case, there's uh, a simple proof the, the solution might be hard to find, but it's easy to check, which is a class MT. So um, the, the purpose of, one of the purposes of theoretical computer science is building up a set of tools and uh, a language and a set of intuitions and a set of techniques with which we can draw qualitative distinctions between the difficulty of different problems and understand that some problems are simply much harder in a deep way than others. Even if your computer gets a little bit faster next year, it'll still be very hard compared to this other problem, which is relatively easy. So it's drawing those qualitative distinctions that um, theoretical computer science, and in particular, computational complexity is all about. And by the way, um, I enjoy teaching a class in which you feel comfortable to interrupt me at any time. There are two ways to ask a question. You can raise your hand, or you can not raise your hand and just blurt it out. I'm happy with either one. Um, OK, so the other book that I'm going to throw at you, although I'm not going to make you pay for it, because that just feels a little bit strange, is uh, a book that I'm writing with a friend of mine. So I will bring this in to, uh, I will bring the first six chapters of this book in on Thursday and hand them out. Um, and some are going to be couriered up to you folks, up to, see so you're over there, uh, yes. Uh, somebody will be couriered up to uh, Los Alamos for the ITV students. Um, uh, I think my book is better. <laughs> um, it's more readable. It's very friendly. It uh, tries to avoid formalism to whatever extent is possible. Um, Sipser's book is more formal, although it's a lot less formal than the books that came before it, so you shouldn't be too mad at Sipser. But um, Sipser includes stuff on, like I said, finite state automata and context-free languages and things like that, whereas then I'll switch here to things like P and NP completeness, um, although SIPs are also cover those things, just not quite as beautifully as, as my book does. <laughs> All right. So, and um, the uh, prologue to my book is on my webpage. Has anyone downloaded it yet? Has anyone visited my, my webpage yet? Okay. Required reading. It's only, I forget, six pages long or something. Required reading for Thursday. I am going to make you read things in the course. Okay. In programming classes, everyone knows that you have to spend a lot of time programming. You can't just go to lecture. You have to spend time with it. Well, this is a theory class. And in my class, you are going to have to spend some time reading and discussing with your friends. 
So um, I encourage you to form study groups, uh, sessions where you drink your favorite beverage with each other and doodle things on napkins and try to work things out. Um, and there is a link on my webpage that should be working now that uh, will allow you to subscribe to a mailing list. Um, and so please subscribe to the mailing list because uh, starting, I don't know, this afternoon, I will do things like emailing out hints, uh, corrections, um, typos in my homework assignments that if you haven't read them, you'll spend hundreds of hours in confusion and despair and so on. So um, please subscribe. Uh, let's see, what other administ trivia? Um, so uh, the homeworks of which there will be five or six, um, you are allowed to work with each other on them uh, as long as you tell me who you collaborated with. And it's kind of on the honor system because after all you're adults and so just as in a programming course you're encouraged to work with each other but um, in many, if it's not explicitly a team course, you're supposed to actually write the code yourself, although you can talk about strategies and ideas. In the same way, you need to write your own solutions at the end of the day, so you can't literally copy them from your friends. But I really encourage you to talk with each other about the ideas and about the techniques, um, see what works, and so on. Uh, let's see. My office hours are 3.30 to 4.30 on Tuesdays immediately after this and two to three on Wednesdays. If neither of those work with your schedule because you have classes on both of them or your job or something, please let me know and I'll try to accommodate you. <sighs> okay, all right, so yes? Do we have a web page for this class? Yes, there's a link to it from my web page. Yeah. Um, yes, and that's where you can download the prologue of the book. So here's what I say in the prologue. But you still have to read it. <laughs> the figures are very nice. So um, let's go back to a place called Königsberg, which is now called Kaliningrad. And a long time ago in Königsberg, uh, well, there's this river called the River Pregel, and it has two islands in it. Um, and there's a bunch of bridges from the islands to the banks of the river and one connecting the two islands. Um, some of this changed in World War II, unfortunately, um, but at least back in the 1700s, this was how things were set up. So um, the good people of Königsberg used to spend some fraction of their time trying to figure out if you could walk over each of these bridges once. How many of you are already intimately familiar with this puzzle? About half, okay. Well, so since we're computer scientists, we know that uh, rather than talking about bridges and islands and riverbanks, we should try to boil this problem down to something slightly more abstract, which is a graph. Um, there are never any colored markers in this room. So here's, here's a graph. So each vertex of this graph will correspond to an island or a riverbank. I'll draw it again over here. And so now the question is, can I explore this graph in such a way that I cover each edge of the graph exactly once? Well, let's try. I'll start down here and uh, go up to this island, maybe come back this way, go up here, and let's go cross over to the other bank, back to this island. Hmm. Well, if I go here now, I'm sort of stuck because I, I'm not allowed to retrace my steps, but I didn't cover this bridge. I could have gone here instead, but then I'm stuck again. Well, maybe it was wrong to go down this way, but the same thing would have happened if I'd gone down this way. So let's back up farther and, okay, so that's one way to solve the problem. Okay, that's called backtracking search. And you can probably program a search like that, given a graph in your favorite programming language. Okay, so for those of you who didn't know the answer 120 seconds ago, is there a way to do this? You, you would all have heard of this puzzle. <laughs> Someone else. Can I, can I cover every edge exactly once? 
Are you sitting doing backtracking search? Humans are not very good at that. You can try, but I think you might get lost. Is there a way to answer that question which does not involve an exhaustive search? Anybody? Is something with the out degree of all the nodes? Yeah, maybe. They, they all have to be the same, but one can differ by <coughs> one or something? Something like that. Well, so um, the great mathematician Leonhard Euler uh, either visited Königsberg or came for a visit or, or lived there, I can't remember which. And he noted the following thing. He said, well, consider a vertex of this graph. Well, we're supposed to cover every edge once, which means that each time you enter this vertex, you have to leave by a different edge. So every time you enter, you have to leave. And this means that the edges of this vertex come in pairs. There is a departure one for every arrival one, which means that unless this is a vertex where we started or ended our tour, in which case there's one more edge, the total degree of this vertex, the degree is simply the number of edges it has, must be even. Okay? So, well, the problem is that um, this let's just write down the degrees, well, they're all odd. Okay? So no tour exists. All right, so, so there's a theorem that says this is both necessary and sufficient. Um, it says that uh, if you have a graph and there are, if there are, if every vertex has even degree, then there is what is now called in Euler's memory an Eulerian tour, which is one that covers every edge exactly once. Um, in fact, if every vertex has even degree, there is an Eulerian cycle, namely one that comes back to where it started. On the other hand, if there are exactly two vertices with odd degree and all the others have even degree, um, for instance, consider this, which is a classic children's puzzle. Here, uh, these two have degree three, but all the others have even, de even degree. Then it turns out that there's always an Eulerian tour which starts and ends, with, which starts at one of the odd degree vertices and ends at the other one. Okay? So, everybody with me? All right, so the point is we didn't have to do the exhaustive search. Um, and, uh, you know, once you have this theorem in hand, it, well, it turns out it's, it's actually not very difficult to construct the tour. But uh, once you have the theorem in hand, you don't even need to construct it if you simply want to answer the yes or no question, does an Eulerian tour exist? All you have to do is check all the degrees of all the vertices and answer yes if at most two of them are odd and answer no if more than two are odd. Um, by the way, can the number of odd degree vertices in a graph, can there be three odd degree vertices? Can there be only one? Finite graph. So exercise. Prove that in any finite graph, yeah. the number of vertices with odd degree has to be an even number. Yeah. Like in this case, there are two. All right. Or there could be zero. Um, or some even number bigger than two. All right, so, so the point is there's two algorithms that, you know, so let's, let's do computer science instead of math. Um, there are two algorithms by which we could solve this. One is the one I started doing. Let's try a tour if you get stuck, backtrack to the last time you could have done something different, follow a different branch of the search tree. Well, if I have n vertices and um, if roughly speaking, just as, a, you know, just as an example, if every time I arrive at a vertex there are two different ways by which I could leave it, well then what's roughly the time that this exhaustive search would take? Roughly, roughly. I have n vertices to visit. Every time I visit one, I have two ways I could leave. Yeah, two to the n. I mean, you know, this is very rough. It could be something else to the n. But the point is it's exponential. 
because I have to make a bunch of choices and each one could go in several different ways. If I have n choices to make, if I'm really doing exhaustive search, it takes two to the n time. All right, well, if I have a graph with n vertices and I simply want to apply Euler's theorem and tell whether the degrees are all even or not, how long does that take? Let's call it n. You could call it n squared. So you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, let's see, my data structure is coarse. We could represent the graph as a, uh, an adjacency matrix, and then I could scan through each row to find out what the degree is. Or, oh, I, I, could, I could represent it as a sparse graph just with a list of edges. I remember that's a little bit more efficient by a factor of n or so when the graph has very few edges. And then I could go through the list of edges, and that would take me. Hmm. All right. Well, the good thing about this class is we don't need to worry about things at that level of detail. So, of course, in the real world of algorithm design, if by using a clever data structure you can get the running time from n squared down to n, this is a huge win, right? I mean, nowadays, if you're studying a large social network, n could be a million, n squared is out of reach, and n is quite reasonable. Um, however, in this class, we're going to make a much more basic distinction, which is just whether... Uh, the running time is polynomial or not. So we're going to have a, a where's my eraser? So we're going to invent a complexity class, which I know you've most of the, most of you have heard of, called P. Oh dear. It's wet. So P is the class of problems which can be solved in an amount of time which grows polynomially as a function of the size of the particular <coughs> instance that you're looking at. Um, so what does this mean? We are going to formalize problems in the following way. So one, one thing which computer science has sort of, I think, offered the rest of the world is that if you want to understand how hard a problem is, you should be very precise about what input you're given and what, answer, what question you're being asked. So we can formalize this problem like this. We'll call it Eulerian path. The input is a graph G, and the output is yes or no, does it have an Eulerian path? So how do I hand you the input? Well, the good news is this doesn't matter too precisely. I could send you an n by n matrix of zeros and ones, the so-called adjacency matrix. So where a i j equals one, if there is an edge from i to j, it could be a directed graph, and zero if not. So that means that if I want to send you a graph with n vertices, I have to email you n squared bits. Or I could send you a list of all the edges, which if there are a few edges could be significantly smaller in the total number of bits. But happily, this doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, because <coughs> what I'm going to say is that this problem, Eulerian path, is in this class P, which means that it can be solved in polynomial time, which means order n to the c for some constant c. And I'm not going to care very much whether c is 1 or 2 or 3, as long as it's some constant. Okay. I'm also not going to care very much whether n is the number of vertices in the graph, as I assumed here, if there are n vertices. A stricter definition is n is the total number of bits that you need to describe this example of the problem to me. Okay? So I set up a, I, I set up a website. I say, email me your graph. I'll tell you whether it has an Eulerian tour. So the question is, how many bits do you need to email me a graph? Well, in this format, it takes n squared bits. 
There are other formats for so-called sparse graphs, which have a small number of edges, which are more uh, efficient. But the point is that a polynomial of n squared is also a polynomial of n, right? Yeah. n squared cubed is just n to the sixth. It's just a different polynomial. So the nice thing about focusing on polynomial time is it erases all the details of the data structures that we use to store things, the specific format that we use to describe things, and so on. And I'm not saying those details don't matter. They really do. But in this course, they don't, because the purpose of this course is to focus on, do we need to do an exhaustive search, or can we skip the exhaustive search? Is it possible, I mean, a different implementation without any, or, I mean, pro probably exceed the polynomial time? <laughs> I mean, well, so, when I say that this problem is in P, I mean there exists an algorithm which works in polynomial time. There exists an efficient algorithm. There exist other algorithms which are not efficient, like exhaustive search. So they do matter in some, in some sense, but uh, not as much, as, right? Well, it, it matters if you care what C is. OK. Yeah, yeah I'm just asking if. Uh, we do not. We do not. We do not care about uh, what C is, as long as it is a polynomial time. Uh, but is it possible? I mean, for the for the efficiency to to I mean to change it a little bit larger, <coughs> it, it exceeds the boundary of I mean polynomial number. You mean are there things bigger than a polynomial but smaller than an exponential? Is that what you're asking? Uh, not exactly. Uh, I'm asking that uh, you say that a detail of the data structure and implementation may 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 change it. Oh, you're saying C. sometimes it can make a big difference. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The, qu the question is how you know. I, I was saying, oh, don't worry about data structures because they. I mean, typically a clever data structure just makes the difference between say an n cubed running time and an n squared running time, or an n squared running time and an n log n running time. It's true that sometimes data structures are so important that they, by using clever data structures, you can go from exponential time all the way down to polynomial time. So, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, but most of the time we won't have to worry about them. Okay. So, um, so, Here's the idea. The intrinsic complexity, uh, or let's focus for a moment on, on the running time of an algorithm. The intrinsic complexity is the running time of the best algorithm, which for time, best means fastest. So the idea is that when I ask, um, and by the way, this is this running time is going to be some function f of n, where n is the size of the input, say the number of vertices in the graph. Um, so the idea is that different that every problem I ask, this Eulerian path problem, for instance, it has an intrinsic running time. It has an intrinsic complexity of the best algorithm. We might not know what the best algorithm is. Okay. But there is one somewhere out there. Okay. And whatever that running time is, um, that gives you uh, that gives you its intrinsic complexity. Well, suppose that you haven't found the best algorithm. One of the interesting things about computer science is it's usually very hard to tell if we have the best algorithm. But if you have some algorithm, at least that gives you an upper bound on the complexity. You can say, well, I found an n cubed algorithm. So at worst, the intrinsic complexity is n cubed. It might be less. Maybe there's a cleverer algorithm which runs in only n squared time. OK. But that's the idea. And this question about the intrinsic complexity of a problem is a mathematical fact. It's not a fact about what computer you happen to own. It's not even a fact about what programming language you like to use. Okay? 
it's not a subjective fact about our abilities as programmers or our computers' abilities as computers. It's an objective mathematical property of this problem. So those are Eulerian tiers. Let's move on to a slightly different one, a slightly different kind of problem. I see we are going to need to ask the university for some more equipment in this room. <laughs> OK. Um, so here's another problem. Um, so what I'm drawing here are the edges of, no, it's not a soccer ball. It's a dodecahedron. It has 12 pentagons, including the one that goes around the outside. I've flattened it out so that it's squashed onto the, uh, onto the graph, uh, on, onto the board. It's one of my favorite graphs. I don't know if you have a favorite graph. So um, uh, Hamilton, Sir Hamilton, who was an English physicist, um, invented a game called the Icosian game. Uh, I'll write that down. So uh, it did not sell very well. Um, but uh, here's how it works. So we start here. And then one of us chooses the first five steps in a path, and then challenges the other to complete the path in a way that visits every vertex exactly once. Uh, will this work? Bing, bing, uh, bing, bing. Oh, no, I got stuck. All right, well, maybe I'll have to backtrack and try again. Okay. So let's think about the solitaire version of this game, where you're just looking at a graph, and you're trying to figure out whether you, there is a way to traverse it, which visits each vertex exactly once. So again, Eulerian paths, we have to cover every edge exactly once. Here, it's OK if there are edges that we don't use, as long as we visit each vertex exactly once. And these types of paths, in Hamilton's honor, are called Hamiltonian paths. Um, although, if do you, do you know what a knight's tour is of the chessboard? So back in like 800 AD, when chess was first getting popular, um, a number of people thought about whether a, a knight can jump around and touch every uh, square of the chessboard exactly once. There was a, yeah, there was um, uh, a Kashmiri poet named Rudrata who was very fond of these things, and so a friend of mine wrote a book about algorithms and and uh, thought that these should be called Rudrata paths because I mean this Hamilton guy you know show up a thousand years later is really a really a, a Johnny come lately into the game, um, but anyway most people call these Hamiltonian paths. All right, so let's solve this problem. What is its intrinsic complexity? Well, once again, we can use exhaustive search. We can start here. There are three ways we can go. Actually, they're all topologically identical, but let's pretend you didn't know that. Um, once you get here, there are two different ways to go, and so on. You keep going until you get stuck in a dead end where every vertex around you has already been visited. If you haven't touched everything, this doesn't work. You have to backtrack, try a different choice. And of course, this will take exponential time. Um, Again, let's say roughly 2 to the n, because this graph has degree 3. Every vertex has degree 3. So every time we enter, we have two ways to leave. Of course, after a while, you have fewer than fewer choices than that, because some places are already closed off. But let's say roughly 2 to the n for the running time of exhaustive search. Well, for Eulerian paths, there is this wonderful insight into the problem having to do with even degrees that allows us to skip all that searching and solve the problem in polynomial time instead of exponential time. Do you see a similar insight for this one? This is maybe an unfair question, because neither does anyone else. So the charming thing about these two problems is that superficially they're very similar. Why should visiting every vertex be that different from crossing every edge? exactly once. But for this problem, as far as we know, there is essentially no way to avoid exhaustive search. There are a number of things you can do to be a little bit smarter than just a brute force search. But roughly speaking, 
As far as we know, the only way to solve it is with brute force search. Okay? So I'm not saying there aren't special tricks for special graphs. Um, you know, for instance, this graph is planar. We can draw it on the board without any crossings. And, you know, there might be some special tricks there that you can use. And we might be able to, in practice, um, find easily find solutions that almost work in some sense. Um, but as far as anyone knows, there's no way to avoid something like exhaustive search for this problem. So to put that more sharply, we believe that the intrinsic complexity of this problem is at least 2 to the a n for some constant a which is bigger than 0. Okay? And again, this belief is not a belief about our cleverness. Okay? It's a belief that no algorithm exists which solves this in polynomial time as opposed to exponential time. Okay? So, um, why should I hold on to such a belief? Well, one of the marvelous uh, triumphs of theoretical computer science is to show that there's a whole bunch of problems up here which are called NP-complete. I'll explain NP in a moment. Which are essentially equivalent to each other in their difficulty. Um, and in particular, if you could solve any one of them, you could solve all of them. Um, if you could solve any one of them in polynomial time, then you could, then you could solve all of them in polynomial time. It turns out that Hamilton, Hamiltonian path, the question of whether there is a Hamiltonian path, is NP complete. And what that means is that if you wake up at 3.30 this morning and realize that your subconscious has come up with a marvelous polynomial time algorithm for this problem, then you will have found a polynomial time algorithm not just for this problem, but for literally thousands of others that no one knows how to solve efficiently. Okay. This, will turn, this fact will turn out not to be so mysterious, actually. But at first, when you're looking at this question of Hamiltonian paths, it's quite mysterious indeed. One of the problems, as it turns out, that you would be able to solve efficiently are questions like this. The Goldbach conjecture is an unsolved problem in mathematics. I used to say the Fermat, Fermat's last theorem, but now it's been proved, so I can't use that one anymore. The Goldbach conjecture states that every even number can be written as the sum of two odd prime numbers. Okay? It's been confirmed using a variety of techniques up to 10 to the zillion, I don't even know, but it's not known if it's true for every even number. Okay? We have to exclude 2 and 4, I guess, yeah, unless you include 1 as a prime, which you shouldn't really, but anyway. so. <clears throat> Consider the following question. Is there a proof of Goldbach's conjecture less than a million symbols long? Okay, well, let's say less than a billion symbols long. Well, if I, if I showed you such a proof, then it wouldn't be too hard to read through it and check it. But there are, if, if our alphabet of mathematical symbols has, say, 30 symbols in it, then there are 30 to the million uh, possible proofs a million symbols long. Most of them are nonsense, I know, but you know some of them are proofs that don't quite work and so on. Now, so there are two ways to s answer this question. Is there a proof of the Goldbach conjecture less than a million symbols long? One is brute force. Go through all of them. Well, this will take you some time. It turns out that if you could solve the Hamiltonian path problem in polynomial time, you could solve this problem in polynomial time, polynomial in a million. In other words, rather than being 30 to the million, which is really, really big, you could solve it in only a million to some constant, which is big, but not so big. Who knows? Maybe C is only two, in which case this is a trillion which is big, but you know, if we all worked, if we all dedicated our laptops to it, we might solve it. Whereas this is astronomically large. This is longer than we, than you know, the age of the universe. Okay. So 
this might seem quite mysterious at the moment, but if our belief that, so it turns out that our belief that this problem takes exponential time is equivalent to the belief that there is no shortcut for finding proofs of things like Goldbach's conjecture. Okay? Which means that either you have to do a lot of searching, which of course is the bad way to do it, or you have to be what humans pride themselves on being. You have to be creative, you have to have good ideas, you have to have good intuitions, which will somehow help you find your way to a proof in this vast space, right? On the other hand, if this problem can be solved efficiently, if the Hamiltonian pro path problem is in P, then doing mathematics is a lot easier than we currently believe. You can just run a mechanical algorithm which will look for proofs, at least proofs of up to a given size. And after all, if there's no proof up to, say, a million, or I'll give you a billion symbols long, then no human will ever find it either. So you might as well just turn the crank. And then there's no, you know, there's no role to play in mathematics for humans. We might as well just all go live on a beach. The same is true of science, and and uh, you know th there there's a, a good philosophical argument that unless this problem is this hard, then all the reasoning that we do is a lot easier than we like to believe it is. So, which is by the way not a claim against artificial intelligence. So, you know, of course I believe in artificial intelligence. I just think that artificial intelligences will have to struggle the same way we have to struggle. They'll have to be intuitive and creative and find good analogies. Um, they won't just be able to turn the crank and apply the same boring technique to every problem they encounter. Okay. All right, so this is so much more interesting than all your other courses in computer science. I know that it's fun to program. I, I like programming too. Um, okay, so um, what is this class NP? So let me get some room here. All right. So, uh, all right. So once again, P is the class of problems for which some algorithm exists that solves it in polynomial time. What is NP? Well, first of all, um, in some pop science books whose authors should be you know, thrown in jail, you're told that N, the N stands for non, that NP is what's outside P. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Um, N is a larger class of problems which contains P. So what is NP? Um, well, the N stands for non-deterministic but this is really a historical artifact. Um, we'll go through several different definitions of NP later. Um, I shouldn't even have told you what N stands for. Because non-deterministic sounds like sort of flipping coins or making choices or making guesses. And well, anyway, ignore that. So NP is the class of problems for which if I show you a solution, you can quickly check that it is one. And that is certainly true here. Okay, if I show you a, a path, you can easily check that it visits every vertex exactly once. Okay? Just like earlier, the traveling salesman problem, which is not too different from this problem, I give you a list of 100 cities with all the distances between them. I ask you, is there a way to tour them all where the total length of the tour is less than 100,000 miles? Or did I say 10,000? Um, if I show you a tour, you can easily check that it works. So NP is the set of problems for which we can check, we can efficiently, meaning in polynomial time, check solutions. And P is the one where we can find them. Okay. Um, good. So here's a question which was on the comps. 
<clears throat> Let's say that I have. Let's see here. Perhaps you've seen a game like this, where you have. It's sometimes uh, well. It's a, a, a peg solitaire game. We used to get these on road trips when I was little. So you have a bunch of pegs. And the pegs sit in these holes in a kind of, in a little lattice. So here are the holes that don't have pegs. There are a lot of different starting positions you could consider. The rules are that you hop one peg over another. And so I hop this peg over this one, and I would put it in here, but then I would remove this one. And the game is to try to end up with a single peg in the center. Okay. So to turn this into a computer science problem, I can't just give you a fixed puzzle. It has to have an interesting input. Um, actually, let me pause for a moment on this question. What is the computational complexity of telling whether in the standard opening position with pawns here and pawns here and rooks here and a queen there and blah, 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 whether white has a winning move, a winning strategy. What is the running time of the fastest program which gives the correct answer to the question, the yes or no question, starting from the standard starting position, does white have a winning strategy in chess? Yes. Oh, this class is not nearly as participatory as I hoped it would be. All right. Well, it's kind of a trick question. Here are two programs. So it's constant. I'm not sure which one of these gives the right answer, but one of them does, and it runs very quickly. Okay. The purpose of this silly trick question is to get across the following idea. In order to have an interesting problem in computer science where we can discuss its computational complexity, it's not enough to look at a single example of the problem, even the example that you most care about. What you have to do is create a family of problems, preferably a family of problems of arbitrary size. So to a computational complexity theorist, this single yes or no question, does white have a winning move starting from the standard position in chess, is not so interesting. Ah, but how about the following question? Input. Um, an n by n board with pieces on it. So rather than the standard starting position on an 8 by 8 board, an arbitrary starting position on a board of arbitrary size, maybe with lots of extra bishops and queens. Okay. And then the question is, does white have a winning move? Or I, I should say not just a winning move, but a winning strategy. Okay. Well, now, obviously, neither of these two programs works because... Sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. Now that we've generalized the problem this way, now we really have to do some work and start, for instance, searching through the tree of possible games unless we can figure some clever way of avoiding that. Okay? All right? So in the same way, I mean, this is why in the Hamiltonian path problem we didn't ask the yes or no question, does Hamilton's favorite graph, the edges of the dodecahedron, have a Hamiltonian path. Instead, we ask the general family of questions. If I give you a graph as input, any graph, can you tell me yes or no does it have a Hamiltonian path? OK? All right. Maybe this was crushingly obvious. No, it wasn't obvious, because you didn't get this trick question right. Or maybe you didn't speak up, even though you knew it in your heart. OK, all right. So um, where was I? So here are the family of problems is I give you a configuration of pegs on an n by n board. 
Okay? I email you this picture on an n by n board. It takes maybe n squared bits to do that. And I ask you, friend, is there a sequence of moves where each time you hop one over the other, you remove the peg you hopped over? Is there a sequence of moves that leaves you with just one peg in the center? Now, um, it's not clear that this problem is in P. Because after all, there are kind of a lot of different sequences of moves we, should, we could try. All right? Now tell me, is this problem in NP? And what would that mean? That would mean that if the answer is yes, check and check, check it. It. Uh, but how do you know the solution is only polynomially long? After all, if the sequence of moves that works is exponentially long, it takes you exponential time just to read it. Well, in this game, you're removing a peg with each yeah. move. Yes. In this game, we're removing a peg with each move. So we know that at most on an n by n board, at most there are n squared pegs. So if a sequence of moves exists, it takes at most n squared moves. So it's only polynomially long. So if the answer is yes, I can prove that to you easily. So let me explain this, this thing. Here I said we can check solutions easily. Another way to put it is, um, remember, we phrase this as a yes or no question. Is there a sequence of moves that works? A way, one way to define the class NP is to say that if the answer to this yes or no question is yes, there is a simple proof of that fact. Now, the question was, does a sequence of moves exist? So here, the proof is to show it to you. Okay. This is true of most problems in NP. Most problems in NP are phrased as, does a blah, blah, blah exist? And then the fact that you can check it if I show it to you means that if the answer is yes, there's a simple proof of that fact. But there are other cases which are, which are not quite phrased that way. So here's, here's another one for you to think about. So consider the following yes or no question. Finality. So the input is an n digit, or if you prefer n bit, I don't really care, because that only makes a constant difference uh, in the length of the number, an n digit integer, which I'll call p. And the question is, is P prime? Well, first of all, suppose the answer is no. Suppose P is not prime. If the answer is no, is there a simple proof of that? How would you prove that? All you have to do is give the, the integer that it divides by. Exactly. So if P isn't a prime, I can quickly prove that to you by showing you one of its factors. Again, that factor might be hard to find. And as we'll talk about later, factoring integers, we think, it's, we think that factoring integers is a hard problem. And indeed, that's why we use RSA public key cryptography when we buy things on the web. And it's why we think that Skype is encrypting our conversations reasonably well when it uses Diffie-Hellman encryption. And if factoring were easy, we could break all those crypto systems, which is why certain agencies um, pay people to think about quantum computing. Um, but the setup here is more like, all right, finding a factor might be hard, but if a friend of yours got lucky and found one, or if a friend of yours had godlike computational power, or if it just fell on you from the sky, you could check it easily, all right? just by dividing P by that factor and checking that yes, it divides through with no remainder. Okay, good. So actually what that means is that non-primality is in P. Uh, sorry, is in NP. I know it seems a little bit strange to think that primality and non-primality could be different kinds of questions. But in a way they are. There are different kinds of properties. So the property of non-primality is easy to prove. Just show me a factor. 
The property of primality, it's a lot less obvious how to prove it. But it turns out that it is possible. So using some clever number theory, it will turn out that primality is also in NP. It turns out that there's a clever way to show you a complete proof um, that, uh, that primality, that a number is prime. Then again, it was shown just four years ago in 2003 by um, Agarwal, Neeton, and Saxena in India that primality is actually in P. In other words, if I give you a thousand digit integer, an n digit integer, I can tell on a, in a polynomial amount of time, polynomial is a function of the number of digits, okay, whether it's prime or not, which was a big surprise. Um, curiously enough, factoring a number still seems to be outside P. Or I should say we don't know if it's in P or not. Okay? Which is a little bit odd. You would think that if we can tell efficiently whether a number is prime, that we could also tell efficiently how to factor a number into its prime factors. I mean, those, those problems would seem to have a similar flavor. But it turns out, as far as we can tell, factoring is still hard. Then again, it could be that uh, somewhere someone has discovered a polynomial time algorithm for primality and it's been hushed up like in those thrillers about the oil industry and the kid who can make energy from water or something. Um, so we don't really know. One of the exciting things about computer science is that every couple of years there is a big surprise like this. So it's easy to, you know, once I show you an algorithm, it's usually easy to prove that it works. But it seems very hard to prove that something, that an algorithm doesn't exist. So how would you prove that something isn't in P? How would you prove that there is no polynomial time algorithm? That's very hard, because there are many different strategies that a possible polynomial algorithm, that a possible algorithm could take. And it seems very hard to reason about all of them at once and to prove that none of them work. Okay. So proving upper bounds on something's complexity is easy. Just show me an algorithm. Every time you show me an algorithm, which is a little bit faster, that pushes down our, the upper bound on its complexity. But proving a lower bound, showing that you can't solve it faster than this, that's very hard. And so far, no one has been able to prove, for instance, that Hamiltonian path really takes exponential time, which is quite charming. But then again, like I said, if it could be solved efficiently, then so could thousands of other problems, including searching for mathematical proofs, which we, which seem to be hard. Yes? Uh, so you said before this problem was proven to be in P, then what was it? Was it in NP? Or? Well, it's in NP because of this thing I, ha I will show you in a couple of weeks, that there is a proof there is a simple way to prove that a number is prime if it is prime. But it was not in NP complete because otherwise other problems. If it had been NP complete, then, well, we haven't talked about NP completeness either, but so skipping ahead a little bit, there is a set of problems kind of at the top of NP, which are the NP complete ones. These are the problems which are the hardest of this entire class in a certain sense. Okay? Um, if any of these turned out to be in polynomial time, then all of NP would crash down, and P and NP would actually be the same. Which would mean that for any problem where you can easily check a solution, you can also easily find one. That seems a little strange. Think about a needle in a haystack, okay? I give you a big stack of hay, all right? I tell you there's a needle somewhere in there. You tell me, prove it. I say, hmm, and I show it to you. And you say, oh, yes, I can easily check this to see if it's a needle. Ouch. <laughs> but it seems like it's very hard to find it in there. Okay. So our, our intuition is that really finding things is a lot harder than just checking them once you've found them. Okay. But no one has been able to prove that. So this, this question, called the P versus NP question, um, 
is now considered one of the outstanding problems, one of the biggest open problems, not just in computer science, but in all of mathematics. There is something called the Clay Mathematics Institute that has offered a million dollars each for the solution to seven different problems. Um, one of them is the Poincaré conjecture, which uh, that Russian guy Perelman recently proved, and he doesn't want the money, and he's kind of eccentric, and he lives with his mom, and anyway. Um, and there's a couple others. One is about the Navier-Stokes equations of hydrodynamics. One is about the Riemann hypothesis, which has to do with the structure of the prime numbers. Okay, these are all nice problems, but this is the biggie. This is the biggie. This is, in some sense, I would claim the deepest of all of these. And um, because it turns out that this is really a question about solving problems in general. It's not a question about the primes or about turbulence or about high dimensional spheres, which is what the Poincaré conjecture was about. It's a question about the difficulty of answering questions. Okay, it's a problem about problems and whether finding things really is harder than checking them. And it's so hard and so deep that um, most people in the field don't think it will be solved anytime soon. There are even kind of bizarre meta theorems, which we'll see um, one example of later, which take entire proof techniques and prove that no, te no technique remotely like that will answer the question of whether P and NP are different. And there are, these meta theorems are so powerful that there are literally no techniques even on the horizon that might solve this problem. So, but if you think you can make a quick million dollars, of course, what is a million dollars compared to the immortality that you would receive? Um, all right. So, um, oh, I, I was telling you about this question on the comp. So here's another question. So, So we've shown that this, this uh, peg puzzle is in NP, okay? Because if there's a solution, then there's a solution only polynomially long, and we can easily check that it works. By the way, it turns out to be NP complete. Cool. Um, here's another puzzle, or another class of puzzles. Of course, what I'm drawing here is just an example of, of the general problem. And these puzzles are quite popular. They're called sliding block puzzles. And you have a bunch of rectangular wooden blocks in a, in a tray. And you know maybe you have some, here's another one, and, and then maybe some over here, and I don't know, something like this. And then there's some space in the middle. And the puzzle is that you have to slide things around and the question is, can you slide this block here out through the bottom? Okay? At least that's this example question. In general, of course, I'm interested in, I'm going to email you a puzzle like this and ask you, uh, and, and the puzzle has an initial position and it has some demands like slide this one out. Or maybe it has a new configuration that I want you to move things into. And I ask you, is there a solution? So is this problem in NP? Again, you know, maybe this is, roughly speaking, this is an N by N board. You can imagine a simple format with which I could describe the initial thing. So why might this not be in NP? There um, could be polynomial uh, ways to move this boxes. And the solution is the sequence of the moves pretty much. It's pretty long, that is exponential. Unlimited in length solution. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, the problem is that it's not obvious here that if there is a solution, then there is a solution which takes only a polynomial, only a polynomial number of moves. Okay? And in fact, clever people have come up with sliding block puzzles like this, or rather families of them, one for each value of n, where the number of moves you need grows exponentially as a function of their size. So what this means is that, um, you know, 
prove, you know, I, I claim to you there is a solution. And you say, oh, well, prove it to me. Well, if this is a hundred by hundred thing, <coughs> you know, then proving it to you could, could require us to sit down and go through an exponentially long solution, and that would take exponential time. Now, it's conceivable that there's some other way to prove that there's a solution, which doesn't involve actually going through the whole thing. But that's a little hard to imagine. Okay. Just as we don't see a way to solve the Hamiltonian path problem without really doing some searching. Okay. So it turns out that this problem is complete for an even higher class, <laughs> which we'll talk about near the end of the semester, called P space. P space is the set of problems you can solve with a polynomial amount of memory. Okay, so now I'm thinking about not how much time your program needs, but how much memory it needs. We can solve this in polynomial memory because each configuration of the blocks, you know, can be encoded in roughly, if it's n by n, something like n squared bits, right? I mean, if you want, just you know, draw zeros and one, you know, make make these edges into ones and something like that. Zeros in the blocks and twos in the spaces. And then it turns out that doing some sort of big backtracking algorithm takes a lot of time, <coughs> not so much memory. Okay. So why why is it the case that we can do a huge backtracking search, and even if it takes exponential time? that it might take only polynomial memory. What's the big difference between memory and time? Well, if you don't need to revisit past solutions, you can work in place in your memory. So you don't need a lot of memory for what could be a long solution. That's true. Um, yes, I mean, to really run the search, you have to keep track of sort of what path you've tried so you can backtrack. Um, but the nice thing is you don't, you might not have to store the entire path. Well, we'll get more into this later. But basically, memory can be reused, right? Which is kind of what you're saying. When you say we can do it in place, you're saying I can change the position and reuse the same memory that I was storing my previous position in. Um, so, you know, whereas time, sadly, cannot be reused. Um, so anyway. These three are just three levels on a vast hierarchy of computational complexity. It goes farther up to what you can solve in exponential time, and then what you can solve in exponential space. Space is just a synonym here for memory. And then in an exponential of an exponential, and then a tower of as many exponentials as you want, and then weirder functions that grow even faster than any of those, and then Somewhere up there in the stratosphere, the set of functions which, you, which are simply computable, which means you can calculate this function, you can solve this problem in some finite amount of time. But I'm giving you no upper bound at all on how big it is. Um, there are lots of gradations within these, and there are also classes below polynomial time. So for one thing, if we do want to pay attention to uh, to the details rather than just saying it's a polynomial. Well, there's the things you can do in n, n cube time and n squared time and n time. Although the, pre the precise definition of those classes is going to get into the details of how you encode your input and what data structures you use and so on. But then there's things inside P like a class called NC, which stands not very illuminatingly for Nix class. NC is the set of problems where if I give you a massively parallel computer, okay, we have to say how massively. I'm going to give you any polynomial number of processors you want, which is pretty massive. So if you want to solve a problem of size n and you want n to the seventh parallel processors, I'll give them to you. And they can each, anyone can talk to any other in unit time, okay? Which, as people who are experienced with parallel computers might tell you, is not very real realistic. But let's assume 
that, that the communication between them isn't a problem. So the idea is that some problems in P can be parallelized. So for some problems in P, if I give you a lot of processors, you can cut the running time all the way down from a polynomial to something which is just a power of the logarithm, which is usually called polylogarithmic for short. So this is even less than a polynomial. Okay. So these are the problems that you can solve very, very quickly on a, parallel, on, a, on a massively parallel computer. But just as there are NP complete problems that we think really require an exponential amount of search, there are P complete problems that we believe even if I give you many, many processors, there's a lot of work that has to be done in sequence. Okay? You know, imagine cooking a meal. If 100 friends come over, you're not going to be able to divide the preparation time by 100. Some things, will, some things you can parallelize, other things you just can't. And so there are p-complete problems that we believe parallelization doesn't help very much. So you can, you can kind of see what this whole theory is trying to do. It's trying to create these classes of problems so that, uh, so that we can draw qualitative distinctions between problems. Do they require an, expo an exponential amount of search, something like an exhaustive search, or is there a shortcut by checking whether every vertex has even degree? Does everything have to be done in sequence, or are there a lot of things that can be done simultaneously? So if you have a massive, massively parallel computer, you can take care of it much more quickly. Um, is there a simple proof if the answer is yes, a solution that can be checked in polynomial time, even if it's hard to find? Or is the property that, you're, that you care about even harder to prove than that? Because it might take say a sequence of moves exponentially long. So that's the idea. That's, that's what this branch of computer science is trying to do. All right. Any questions? Okay. I, I wasn't interrupted nearly enough today. It's very rude. <laughs> it's very rude not to interrupt me. <laughs> so, um, okay, so download and read the prologue for Thursday. It overlaps a lot with what I said today, but maybe that's good. Um, now, starting on Thursday, uh, we're going to start talking about a kind of computer which is like way down here, um, namely a finite state atomic. And we're going to talk about what they can do and what they can't do, and how in this case we can prove sometimes that they really can't do something. Which is sort of a it's sort of a nice baby example because it's very hard to prove that something can't be solved in polynomial time, but it's not so hard to prove that something can't be solved by a finite state automaton. That's what we'll talk about Thursday. So my office hours are 3:30 to 4:30 today, Tuesdays, and from 2 to 3 on Wednesdays. Oh, I already said this. And if those if neither of those work for you, email me. And. Uh, Oh, welcome to the class. Uh, yes, there will be there will be a uh, a take home midterm and a take home final, on which unlike the homework, you're really not supposed to cover it. Let's do exams. There might be like a three. Yeah. Did you bring the lunch there?